Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Bolivia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Bolivia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I discuss quantitative stock investing and its advantages and disadvantages over human-based investing and judgment. Quantitative strategies certainly have some pluses, but like most things in investing in life, there are two sides to the story. Jack also shares a personal investing experience where the deviation from his quant-like method ended up costing him. At least he can look back on that now and realize where he went wrong. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Just one more quick note. My part of the video this week is a little shaky. It's due to a new webcam I got that wasn't secured on properly. I apologize about this. It will be corrected going forward. Thank you. All right, this week you wrote an article on um, human versus quant type of investing. And I think what you're really trying to do is just it wasn't really supposed to be a piece about one's better than the other, but what you were trying to do is look at the advantages and the disadvantages of 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 each one. Um, and what investors kind of should be thinking about um, when following or using those types of investment strategies. So just to start, do you want to um, maybe give a sort of summary of the article and then we can get into the, some of the specifics? Yeah, so my goal here is, you know, we're, we're quant investors. And so we have this tendency to believe that the only way to invest is, is quantitatively. You know, it removes emotion, it removes biases from the picture. All the things it does, we have this tendency to believe there's no other way to do it. Why would you ever have a human portfolio manager? But there are certain situations where humans can do better things than quants. I mean, there, there are definitely limits to what computers can do right now. They can't think like human beings. So there are limits to what quant strategies can do. And so my goal with the article was to maybe take a step back and say, all right, I, I might believe quant investing is the only way to go, but let's look at both sides of this and see what the advantages are to both strategies. In terms of um, some of the advantages of quantitative investing, you sort of pointed to a few, and I think I have a few that I'd like to discuss too. But maybe to start, um, one of the key things is, you know, it removes since they're systematic and quantitative, it obviously removes emotions and biases from the decision-making process. Yeah, that, that's probably the most important one. And, you know, we, we've had Daniel Crosby on our podcast now. We've had Jim O'Shaughnessy. And, you know, those guys have probably studied this more than anyone. And, you know, one of the things both of them say is you can study this all you want. You can study your biases. You can study the impact of your emotions on your investing. You can't get rid of them. And so no matter how much you study it, you can't get rid of them. And so using a quant strategy allows you as much as possible, and we'll talk about maybe why you can't completely do it later, but using a quant strategy as much as possible allows you to limit the impact of those biases on your, you know, on your investing approach. Um, one of the things that, and I think quantitative investing has really come, I mean, it's, it's probably been like a 20-year trend that has emerged with computing power and stuff like that. I mean, we've been running our model since 03, so we're actually coming up on 20 years. Um, of running these quantitative strategies, but some of the other things I think they that they allow an investor to do is, you know, you can analyze hundreds or thousands of stocks um, very efficiently doing that. So you can get through a lot of stock ideas, and you can find a lot of new ideas by using um, a quantitative system. Um, the other thing I was kind of thinking, like, and a lot of times investors when they buy stocks, they buy mostly what they know. So they buy stocks that they're familiar with. Um, maybe one of the advantages of a quantitative system is that, you know, it does bring you into ideas that, you know, you might not otherwise have been exposed to because you can analyze hundreds or thousands of stocks all at once. Right. You know, and those, those both sort of play together because, you know, if, if you know a small amount of companies and, and that's what you want to invest in, that sort of becomes your investable universe. And so you're, you're picking from a very small number of stocks. And as you said, with the wide variety of, of stocks, quant strategies can look at, you know, as a quant investor, we can look at probably say 2,800 stocks or something like that. And, and we can, we can whittle those down with a computer. Whereas a human, you know, if they're buying what they know, they'll never have any way they can go through 2,800 stocks and, and look at all of them. Yeah. And I think that plays into maybe your next point, which is the sell discipline, the sell strategy, because I do think that for people that are picking their own stocks, um, even professional portfolio managers, you know, they become, um, maybe too, too, uh, too committed to the stock and, they, and they, they may not have the ability or lack the ability to sell it when they should. Whereas a quantitative system, you know, embedded in that 
is sort of a disciplined sell strategy and portfolio management, let's say, framework. Um, that was one of the other advantages that you pointed out in your article. Yeah, there's, there's probably no time where your biases impact you as an investor more than when you're trying to sell. Like you said, you can get married to positions. You know, you can you can want to ride your winners. You can want to get rid of your losers. There's all kinds of things that all kinds of ways your biases play into a sell decision. And with a quant strategy, we're just looking at the numbers. We're just looking at the fundamentals. And, and I think that can be a big advantage when trying to sell because that's the point where you're probably most affected as a human being. And so having a, a quantitative strategy step in and make that decision for you, that's probably one of the best places to use a quant strategy. And by the way, you didn't even follow your own quant strategy earlier in the year, did you? <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in, in my personal portfolio, because we're in the asset management business, you know, we're, we're so tied. Everything we do is tied to asset management. So, you know, the, our income, our value of our business, you know, our portfolios, our kids' college education, everything goes down when the market goes down. And so one of the things I do in my personal portfolio, especially when the market's at, a, at an elevated valuation, is I hold some sort of tail risk position. And so what happened is coming into this year, I had that tail risk position, you know, a small position against the small cap value stocks I had. And then the market started going down. And, you know, what I hadn't done in advance is established a disciplined quantitative system for how I was going to determine when to get rid of the tail risk position. And so I did what, what, what a lot of people do. As, this, as I started making money on the tail risk position, as the market got down 10, 15 percent, I decided, you know what, that this is probably the end of the decline. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get rid of the tail risk position. And, you know, that was when the market was down, say, 15 percent. And then the market went down to 35 percent. And because of the magnification of these tail risk strategies, between 15 and 35 percent, you got a huge return on these tail risk strategies. I mean, probably one of the best returns on tail risk strategies we'll ever see in our lifetime. And I missed a good portion of that because I hadn't set a quantitative system in advance as to when I was going to sell. And I could let my emotions get in there. And I had sort of decided, all right, this, this sell-off has run its course. And I was totally wrong about that. So, you know, all of us, even if we're quantitative investors, when we take that quantitative system out of the picture, we have a tendency to, you know, let all these emotions and biases get in the picture. And, you know, it can, it can lead to really bad decisions. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I'm sorry about that. Sorry that happened to you. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> um, all right, let's kind of talk a little bit now about sort of the advantages that humans might have um, over quantitative systems. And I think a lot, you know, most investing probably happens this way. Um, even though quant investing has gotten big and a lot more popular, um, you know, most investors aren't using quantitative models. Most are using their own judgment and, you know, some analysis, I'm sure, a lot of analysis for, for professionals, um, but, you know, to find uh, stocks. So, I mean, one of the points you made was that, you know, humans – um, can perform or maybe analyze companies more accurately when the details matter um, the most. So what were you trying to get at with that? Yeah, so, so to use an example, let's, let's look at the coronavirus situation when it hit. Um, so you had a situation where we shut down the entire economy. So now as quant investors, specific, specifically value investors, we're looking at past historical fundamentals to try to decide what stocks do we buy. But now the entire economy is shut down. And so one of the things that can become important at that point when the entire economy shuts down is which companies can, be, can get through to the back side of this. So if you have no revenue whatsoever, how long can your company last you know, where you can pay your expenses out of the cash that you have? And so that, that's, a system, that's a situation where a quant can't really analyze that that well. So, I, I mean, I can run a screen where I say, all right, let's look at this company's cash balance. Let's look at their, if I subtract all their revenue out and they have to pay their expenses, how long can they last? But that's going to be a really, really short period of time. And it's not going to be accurate mm -hmm. because companies have the ability to do things like defer expenses, cut expenses, you know, renegotiate deals they have, issue debt, pull from lines of credit. You know, some companies got government assistance. So I can't quantify all those things. So if I'm trying to figure out which value stocks are going to be alive on the other side of this, that's a better job for a human being than it is for a quantitative strategy. Um, and another example of the same thing is if because these strategies are backward looking, if I had two stocks I was looking at that say traded at 10 times earnings, let's say one's an airline and let's say one makes cleaning supplies or something like that. You know, if I'm evaluating those at the beginning of the coronavirus situation as a quant, I'm looking at them sort of the same. They both trade at 10 times earnings. But the reality is the one with the cleaning supplies is going to do really well because something has just happened that's going to make cleaning supplies, you know, sell a lot more than they traditionally do. And the airline is in a whole world of trouble because their traffic is going to be down 90 percent. So that's another example where a human could step in and say, all right, these companies both traded 10 times earnings, but something has just changed. And, you know, it may not be best to use past fundamentals to evaluate these companies. One of the things that that made me think of, though, is just to counter that, you know, you can because I know like with our um, 
system, you know, we've tried to take things like analyst earnings projections into account in terms of our, our negative screen screen. So, you know, maybe you're, you're right that, you know, uh, a human is going to be able to sort of analyze that situation better, but a quant system, you might be able to have some elements be integrated in, um, into a quantitative system that may act somewhat like a human would. Yeah, you know, we do two things that help with that. One is we buy a basket of securities. So we spread our bets over a good number of companies. So there might be some companies in there that are airlines, but there also might be some companies that make cleaning supplies. And so by spreading our bets, we're minimizing that risk. Mm -hmm. And also, like you said, you know, we can use these negative screens to say, all right, let's not hold companies with too much debt, or let's not hold companies whose cash flows aren't keeping up with earnings, or let's not hold companies where analysts think the earnings are going to plummet in the future. So if we use a negative screen to get the absolute worst companies out, that can help us as well. So we can never do it as well as a human being can do it, but I think we still, you know, we still can do some things to mitigate this type of thing. I also think that like one of the core sort of bedrock principles of what com how companies are valued and what the value of companies are is, you know, discounting the future cash flows of the company back to get a, you know, intrinsic value on the firm. Um, and I mean, that's essentially how Wall Street analysts come up with valuations on, you know, many of these companies. And so a, a human, you know, th there's inputs and there's assumptions that can be made into their models that allow them to do that. I think that humans might be able to, I, I don't know if you agree with this, but especially for companies or industries that are growing a lot, you know, a quant model is going to have a hard time analyzing those, let's say, high growth type of companies. Um, whereas a human analyst, you know, in certain situations might be able to do a better job at looking at something and saying, you know what, the future growth in this industry or this company is going to be whatever, 40 or 50 percent per year for the next three or four years, something like that, if it's a high growth industry. So I do think that's another area where humans might be able to look at like the trends in the market and the companies that are benefiting from those trends and then, you know, trying to do a better job of looking at what those future cash flows might look like. But with that being said, that's a very hard thing to do as well. So I, I'm not saying they're perfect with it. It's just I was thinking of where a human might have an advantage over a quant here. Yeah, no, I do agree with you that in the growth space, the advantage might be a little bit more towards a human than it would be in something like value. Because um, as you said, trying to figure out, you know, one of the things about growth investing is a very small, uh, if you look at all expensive stocks, a very small portion of those companies do well and they do exceptionally well and, and they drive the performance of the whole group. So a human might have a better opportunity to identify that select group of companies than a quant strategy would. Right. Um, what you also sort of pointed out is that a lot of times it's not an either or thing. I mean, most investors, many investors are using elements of quantitative type of modeling or analysis. And then they're also combining that with like human judgment. That's right. You know, everybody does a little bit of both here. You know, as quants, we have to decide what goes into our models. We have to decide when we change our models. And, you know, that that involves our, our human decision making. That involves our biases coming into the equation. And, you know, when humans look at things, as we talked about earlier, you know, if, if I want to screen 2,800 stocks down to a group I can actually analyze as a person, you know, screens are a popular way to do that. And so most human investors will have some sort of screening criteria where they at least whittle the list down to something they can look at before they apply their human judgment and decide what to buy and sell. Um, I saw this on Twitter yesterday and I, it just jumped out at me because I thought it was going to be, it is really relevant to the conversation. So it was an interview with Bill Ackman on this David Rubenstein show on Bloomberg. Um, and the heading of the, and Tobias Carlyle's Acquire Multiple sort of highlighted this interview, but it, it says, Bill Ackman, colon, engrave your investment principles in stone and stick to them. And so here you have, you know, a, a fund manager with a really good long-term track record, who's known as kind of an activist guy, um, coming in and buying companies and, and trying to influence change. But you know what he was essentially saying there, though, is even though he's a, a fundamental analyst, you know he still has a extremely disciplined process um, that he he goes through and that he's saying is important. So you do get this sort of intersection. I mean, a lot of great investors. Buffett's another one that. You know, he talks a lot about discipline and controlling your temperament and those types of things rather than having like some astronomical high cue. He, he believes that, you know, 
the success in investing is more about controlling your temperament and your emotions and not letting those things get you in trouble and then sticking to what is a relatively straightforward investment process. Um, and so there, these things kind of start to get blurred a little bit um, between the human and quant side, I think. Even if you're making your own decisions, it's great to have somewhat of a systematic process. And so it's a list you go through or a type of th thing you're looking for in companies. You know, when your investment process becomes a complete free for all where you have no rules, you know, very few people can succeed that way. So getting back to the Ackman point, even people who are really good investors who are not quants, they typically have a process they go through. They typically have things they look for. So as you said, there's aspects of this in what everybody does. You know, humans have some quant principles and quants have some human decision making. This is definitely not an either or thing. By the way, Matt Ackman piece, just to, just to end that, I'll end on this note, I guess he, you know, and then the, the outline was, you know, invest in simple businesses that are predictable, that have free cash flow generation, that are dominant companies in their industries, that have large barriers to entry, high returns on capital, limited exposure to extrinsic risk, they don't need excess, excess or external capital to survive, and have excellent management. I mean, all of those things could actually be tied to fundamentals where you could almost build a quantitative model off of it, I think. Yeah, no, most of that these days, you could, you, you know, especially given what's going on machine learning and stuff, I mean, most of those probably could be turned into a quant strategy. One of the things that... Um, I really thought was a good point that Jim O'Shaughnessy made in our last um, podcast was their uh, investment research graveyard and how, you know, one of the things that they've done as a quantitative investment investment firm, they're always, and this was his overall bigger point, even though they're quant and they have these models and it takes a lot to change these models, they are always learning, looking at different factors, you know, trying to improve their models to get the best long-term outperformance. And so I think sometimes, like the way we build models is we capture the models from books or academic papers, and then we do run those models. Those models stay relatively static. Um, but, you know, we've also tried to do the same thing by improving our investing system by layering in like things like the negative quality screen or other methods. So, you know, just because it's quant, it doesn't mean that it's, set in stone and um you know that was that was just something that really jumped and you actually made that point in your article with the with the price to book example yeah and you know and, and even for us is you know we we just summarize you know we basically follow models that are built into research papers but we have a big research graveyard as well and the research graveyard is all these research papers we've looked at where when we tested it it didn't stand up you know we, we've looked at we look at a lot of models in terms of relative to how many we actually implement, we look at a lot of models. And, and like you said, you know, there's still decision making around the edges of, you know, are you going to screen out negative quality companies? There, there's a lot of things you still have to decide and, and you're, you, can, you have to be careful that your emotions don't play too big a role in that process um, as, as you're figuring that out. And that may be kind of a good way to conclude it, which is, you know, your emotions and your behaviors as an investor are probably more important than what type of style, whether quantitative or whether you're a human, making your human judgments or analyst, the, you know, the behavior is, is probably going to be the biggest influence of your investment returns over time. Um, um, right. That was kind of how you, yeah, I think no, I mean, the best investment strategy for any person is the strategy they believe in. Obvi obviously subject to limits. I mean, if, if my strategy is buy expensive companies that have tons of debt, right. you know, that's probably not the right strategy, but assuming it's a strategy that works, you know, a lot of this decision about whether you have a human portfolio manager or whether you follow a quant strategy is in the eye of the person following the strategy. So some people just feel better knowing there's a person there behind the scenes who's making the decisions about the portfolio, whether that adds value or not. If you believe that and if, if you're more comfortable with that and you're more likely to stick with that, then that's probably a better strategy for you than a quant strategy. I don't think there's a right answer. I think it really comes down to each person and what they believe. Yeah, that's great. So I think this was a good article. We'll actually put the link to this in the show notes and on YouTube. So if you're interested in maybe a more detailed version of what we've been discussing, um, take a look at that. And uh, we hope you found this valuable and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.